Hi everyone, uh, my name is Martin Brown. I'm a GD for Kotlin and Android, and I work as an Android developer advocate at Stream. Uh, you can find me at the booth later uh, to talk about our chat SDK and our chat product in general. Uh, today, I'm giving one of my favorite talks here, uh, which is Mastering API Visibility in Kotlin. So to kick things off, I want to talk about what an API surface is. Um, when you're developing a module, whether it's one of the modules in a multi-module Android application, or it's a library that you're going to ship to your uh, customers, um, you have classes inside that module, and you have smaller constructs like functions and properties inside of those classes. And uh, for each of these, you can choose whether you want to expose them to the external world or not. So you can make this decision for each class. You can kind of push it to the boundaries of your module, and then it will be visible from the outside. And then for each smaller construct inside there, you can also make the same kinds of decisions. So function by function, property by property, you can pick whether you want these to be exposed or not. And the pieces of your API that you choose to push to the module boundary that you make accessible from the outside, uh, you can kind of think of that as the attack surface of the API. So whenever people are trying to use your library, and that's what they're going to call into. That's what you have to be very, very careful with because if you make mistakes there, you're gonna uh, have people complaining that things don't work and you're gonna give yourself a hard time in maintenance later. So uh, with this uh, clarified, uh, I'm gonna simplify this uh, chart to something like this. So we still have a module. The green parts are the private non-exposed parts and the orange parts are the publicly visible things. Of course, these depend on each other in various ways. Uh, usually the public facing API depends on some uh, private implementation and there can be a lot of complex code in there. Then uh, you have your module and you also have some kind of consumer, uh, some user that's calling into your library. And whenever they do that, they're of course gonna depend on some pieces of your public API like this. The first idea that I want to get across in this talk is that it's a very good idea to create minimal APIs. If we go to the good book, and of course I mean effective Java, uh, we'll find item 15 to be minimize the accessibility of classes and members. Um, so even effective Java mentions the idea that you should minimize visibility and accessibility as much as possible. Uh, this item is in chapter four titled classes and interfaces. And it's actually the very first item in that chapter. So this should tell you that this is a very important uh, concept in object-oriented design. And it also applies to our Kotlin world where not everything is object-oriented. We also have top-level functions and things like that, but it still uh, holds true. So uh, why do we want minimal APIs? I'm not gonna recite the entire effective Java item here. You should really go and read that book separately on your own but I'll list just a couple of reasons. So first up, minimal APIs are easier to maintain and change. Uh, whatever is not exposed from your module, you can freely change and uh, remove and add to at any time, and you won't be affecting your consumers. However, if you have public API that you've changed your mind about and you remove it, you'll suddenly have broken customer code and people will be complaining and uh, telling you that you've broken their applications. What about pieces of your public API that people are not using? So for example, this node here, uh, nobody's depending on this uh, according to the chart. Well, uh, this kind of unused public API is really an illusion. If you've ever published something and made it available to the external world, um, so let's say that it's not just uh, within your own uh, multi-module application, but this is a library that you've actually shipped somewhere public, uh, then there is always going to be a chance that someone has immediately started using that API and they are now depending on it. So there really is no public API in a publicly available library that's safe to simply remove. Let me give you an example of uh, what Kotlin allows you to do when you do need to uh, remove a public API. And I'm going to use an example here 
uh, where I had to remove a method because uh, it's supposed to be uh, replaced by two different method calls instead. So I have a single method here with two parameters and in the new API, I want people to call two methods and pass in these parameters separately. For this, we have the Kotlin deprecated annotation, which takes a message where you can, uh, in plain English, describe uh, what they should do to migrate from the old API to the new one. And you can also specify a deprecation level, uh, which is warning by default. To make migration easier for your clients, you can also add an optional replace with block, which takes a string parameter. Um, and as long as you write sensible, correct Kotlin code within this string, uh, which is unfortunately unchecked, so you, you'll just have to check this yourself if you've succeeded. Um, but as long as you write valid Kotlin code, uh, like in this case, I'm uh, writing down the two chain method calls that I want people to replace the original single call with. Then on the use site, other than showing the deprecation warning, if uh, your clients uh, toggle intention actions, they're gonna get an automatic replacement action there, which lets them migrate from the deprecated API to the new one. You can even add an imports array here, again, an optional parameter, in case you need to uh, add some new imports for the new syntax to make sense. For example, if you want people to migrate away from one class in one package to another class in another, you would use this a lot. You can also uh, raise the deprecation level to an error, which would change the call site to this. Um, so the code in this case would no longer compile, but it would still uh, resolve and show you the string prep function and the replace with action would also be still available. Now, uh, users can suppress even this error level warning, but it takes a lot of work and usually uh, they'll only end up suppressing the warnings, but not the errors. So this is pretty strong already. But you also have one more deprecation level, which is hidden. If you do this, your API will be invisible at the source level. So no more uh, migration assistance from one uh, API to the other with replace with, uh, because now it, the ID will just say that this reference is unresolved. And this hidden deprecation level is useful if you don't want anyone to write new code that refers to this, or you want them to remove any existing code that refers to this, but you don't want to break binary compatibility. So any code that's already compiled bytecode that's not recompiled will still be able to call into your library. It's just that at the source level, this method will now be hidden. I wrote about two years ago about source and binary compatibility and uh, more about deprecation. So I encourage you to check out that article if you're interested in this. Going back to why minimal APIs are great, they are also easier to learn. Imagine that you have a module where you have a dozen classes and a hundred methods exposed to your clients. In order to start using this, uh, they have to find the proper entry points to use. Uh, they're seeing a lot of classes. They don't know which ones they can instantiate or which ones they should because they can create instances of all of them. Um, then on each class, they're seeing a lot of different methods. Uh, it's a lot easier if you make your API smaller and define some clear entry points so that your clients can discover your API's capabilities from there. Um, from there, uh, if you have a small enough API, uh, they can probably just discover it with the help of the IDE auto-completion and code navigation features. And of course, a minimal API is harder to misuse. If you don't expose things that you don't expect clients to call, they won't call them, uh, which will save a lot of time in support if you want to support your library at least. Um, so uh, if you expose a lot of things, people will start calling random parts of your API and will make calls to methods that you never expected them to make, and that will make everyone's life harder. So how do you get to this API where it's minimal and nice and designed? Well, it's really all in the planning. Uh, it's very hard to change existing public API, although you can with deprecation processes and so on, but the best thing you can do is uh, plan ahead and first just define the public facing parts of a module. So just think of what you want your clients to be looking at, uh, what their client code should look like when they're calling into your library. And once you've made that simple and obvious and well thought out, you can go ahead and figure out the messy, potentially messy uh, internal implementation 
for all of that functionality. Okay, uh, now let's go into more Kotlin specific details and see some things that you can use in Kotlin to control visibility. The default visibility in Kotlin is public. This is what everything is, unless you add a explicit visibility modifier. On the other end of the visibility range, there's private, which makes things restricted to be used in a single class or in a single file if they're top level. And then somewhere in the middle, there's internal. And internal is a super useful visibility modifier, which you should use a lot if you're working with modules. Internal makes things available within the current module, but not outside of it. Uh, so this makes uh, calling things uh, within your module uh, from different files to different packages um, easy, but it won't expose them to the external world. Uh, this is a visibility that didn't exist in Java. Some examples of when this is useful. Uh, let's say that you have a public facing service interface that allows, you, allows your clients to create users. In this case, you probably have some private implementation of this interface inside your library. And internal is a great visibility modifier for this kind of implementation class, as you'll be able to create instances of this service within your library, but your clients will never know that the class exists because it doesn't leak outside of the current module. Similarly, you can make just parts of a class internal, which can be a great benefit. For example, here's a network client which stores a piece of state and we want our clients to be able to read that state, so we're exposing that, that's why it's all orange, but we don't want them to be able to modify it. So in this case, we can still use a var, a mutable variable property, uh, but we can mark its setter with internal set that makes it so that only code within the module can change the value of this property and everyone else outside will only see this as a read-only val. A great place to use internal visibility is when you're using extension functions, especially if you're extending common types. If you need to extend the string type because you do a lot of uh, common transformations all, uh, all over the place in your own code, it's a very good idea to do that extension as an internal function, because otherwise you'll uh, follow to the auto-completion results of all of your downstream clients. The same applies to very generic uh, top-level functions. For example, if you're a image loading library and you need to uh, do a calculation for your image sizing needs uh, of some sort, you shouldn't expose the internal functions that you use for the, those calculations because people will start relying on them in completely unrelated pieces of their application because they just accidentally find this average of function and well, it works, so they start relying on it. So be careful that you don't provide things from your library that are unrelated to what you're supposed to be solving. Let's talk a bit about testing. Uh, whenever you have private properties in your code and you try to test them and um, maybe assert that they're in a certain state, that's gonna produce an error as private things, as I already mentioned, are not visible outside of the file or the class that they're in. However, internal comes in useful here, uh, comes in handy here, <laughs> uh, because uh, anything that's internal is only visible within its own module, but it's also visible in the test source set of the same module. So internal visibility is good if you need to expose something only for testing, but not to the outside world. If you want to be really neat about this, you can also use the visible for testing annotation to indicate that you only made this exposed uh, even this much for testing purposes, and it should otherwise be private, for example. Java interop is something important to consider when you're using internal uh, visibility. If you have, say, a class like this that has a internal method inside it, it turns out that you'll still be able to call this from Java. So let's create a Java method. And inside there, uh, we'll find that we can create an instance of this repository class and call the method inside it. So what happens here is that, as I mentioned already, internal does not exist in the context of Java. There was no concept of internal visibility there. 
So anything that's internal in Kotlin gets translated to public in the bytecode. It just has a bunch of metadata in there, which prevents other Kotlin code from calling into it, as it understand that's, understands that that's an internal declaration. Since this doesn't mean anything, anything to Java, it just lets you call these internal methods. As you can see, the Kotlin compiler tries a bit uh, by um, jumbling up the class name or the method name um, by adding the postfix of the name of the module it, it's coming from. On Android, it would also add the uh, current build flavor or build variant to this, uh, so it would look even uglier. Um, but technically, clients can still call this if they really want to. Uh, turns out you can also control the name of this generated method if you uh, wish uh, for Java clients. Uh, for example, you can make it something scary that will hopefully make Java clients not use it. Um, but like clearly this is not a, not a very nice solution. Um, however, there is a good solution to this problem, which is the JVM synthetic annotation. Uh, this will mark the method as synthetic in the bytecode. And anything that's synthetic is not available from Java source code at all. So at this point, this method becomes entirely invisible to all Java code. Uh, actually, whether or not it's in your current module or, um, or in someone else's. Um, but most likely, if you're writing a Kotlin project, uh, you don't have Java code within the same module that you want to be able to call into it. So if you have Java clients, use JVM synthetic a lot. The next topic that I want to move on to is explicit API mode. Uh, this is a tool that Kotlin provides you to make sure that you're thinking more about uh, visibility in your modules. It enforces two things. First, it forces you to use explicit visibility on all of your declarations, even if they are public, which is the default visibility. And it forces you to use explicit types for all public declarations. Before we look at what this means in the code, let's see how we can configure this in a project. To enable explicit API mode, uh, you can do this very simple configuration. Uh, in your build Gradle file, you can open a Kotlin block and call explicit API in there. Or you can do this the more complicated way, which looks kind of scary at first, but turns out is very useful. You can take all Kotlin compilation tasks and apply ar compiler arguments to them. And if you set the explicit API argument to strict, then uh, that's going to do the exact same configuration as the example on the top of the slide. The reason why you would want to use this lengthier syntax is because um, you get the ability to add more compiler flags while you're here. For example, there's something called progressive mode in the Kotlin compiler which makes you opt into new language changes faster than it's required. So this way you can keep up to date with all of the um, new language changes and make sure that you, you're like not behind on migrating your project to them. By default, explicit API mode is strict, which means that anything that doesn't comply with it will be an error. You can Migrate your large projects to explicit API mode uh, module by module, as this is a module level configuration. But you might have very large modules that you don't want to migrate all at once, and enabling it with an error would uh, be too much work for like one pull request, for example. So for those cases, you can also use just the warning configuration for explicit API mode, which will um, still let your code compile but show you ID warnings for all of the places where it's breaking the rules of explicit API mode. Here's an example of a simple class. And if we were to enable explicit API mode, it would light up like this. Uh, we would see errors everywhere. So uh, we would have to consider what visibility we want to give all of these uh, different declarations. So we would have to specify that this class should be public that we meant for these uh, properties to be public as well. And we should consider for each method whether we want them to be public or not. This say hi method was probably intended to be public. But uh, let's say that we find this weird reset method, which, well, it looks like something for testing. It's, it's, it's a very specific method that, that resets this class into some weird state. So that's probably not something we actually wanted to publish. 
So since we are reviewing our API due to enabling explicit API mode, this is a good time to just make that internal and stop clients from using it if they are accidentally doing that. The other thing that explicit API mode forces is explicit types on all of your public API. In this example, I have a variable that stores a default client and its type is client as I'm assigning a client object to it. And I'm returning this from an interface. So the interface method also has this same return type. Uh, explicit API mode would not allow this, that I'm implicitly setting the return type of this uh, public facing function. And this is for a very good reason. Imagine, for example, that I change what the default client is. For example, I have an offline client instead, and that's what I'm going to use as the default. By doing this, uh, through type inference, I would actually change the return type of the client method inside the interface. And anyone who's implemented it to return some kind of simple client would now be forced to fix their code and make sure that they're returning an offline client specifically, uh, which by the way would be a bug. So to avoid this kind of uh, accidental change to public API through type inference, you have to state all of your public return types explicitly like this if you have this mode enabled. The next thing I want to look at is published API. This has to do with inline functions. And I'm going to use this example where I have an inline function called song that calls into another implementation function, which is internal and contains the functionality that we want to run when someone calls the song function. If we write client code in another module, uh, we would of course call the public facing and inline function. This code actually doesn't compile. We would get a compiler error on this line where we try to call an internal function inside of an inline function. Uh, this says public API inline function cannot access non-public API. Um, so what does this error mean and why is it complaining? Well, uh, the way that inline functions work, uh, whenever someone calls them on uh, in their client code, the body of the inline function essentially gets copy pasted to the call site uh, when the, well, not at the source level, but when compilation happens. Uh, if we want to represent this at the source level, we are basically copying this call to the secret function, function uh, into our client code. And this would mean that our clients end up with bytecode that references an internal function inside our module, which should never happen. The point of internal visibility is that we're supposed to be safe from external users. Uh, we're supposed to be able to remove or change these methods freely. But if someone can compile code that contains references to that, that wouldn't be true anymore. So uh, the Kotlin language has a solution for this exact situation and this exact problem, which is called published API. This is an annotation that you can put on internal functions so that you make them available for inlining purposes. So this would make the code above compile. We could now inline this internal function, but because we have this published API annotation on it, we would now have to treat this as public API and only change it as carefully as we would change public API. The upside of this, instead of just making it simply public, is that this function is still internal. So if someone calls, tries to call it directly, that will still fail. Uh, again, uh, this kind of uh, binary and source compatibility is something I've written about earlier. So I'll have this. Uh, blog post in the resources at the end of the talk. For our last topic today, uh, let's talk a bit about opt-in APIs. I had this scenario earlier where I was showing you a library module and a client that depends on some of the public pieces of it. Let's say that this is just the core library that we're shipping and we want to ship another module, another library module, which extends the core library in some way. Um, it adds new features, it adds integration with some other new libraries or something like that. This library would also be used in a similar way by our clients. They would call into the public facing exposed parts of the add-on module. 
And to implement the add-on module itself, we could depend on public API of the core module. But we can also imagine a scenario where we need this kind of dependency. So when we want some private uh, thing in the core module to be exposed to the add-on module, but we only want to share this within our own libraries and we don't want clients to access it. So here we have the trouble that we want this to be internal so that clients can see it, but we want it to be public just for our own library's sake so that we can share that code. The solution here is going to be something called opt-in APIs. And to use this, we're going to go to the core module first and declare a new annotation in there. I'm calling this internal my library API. To make this an opt-in marker annotation, I have to annotate it, the I have to annotate the annotation with the requires opt-in annotation. And here I can specify what error level this should produce. This can be an error or it can be a warning when someone tries to use these APIs. And I get to specify a message that tells people why uh, I'm marking some of my API with this internal my library API annotation. Again, this can be an error or a warning, but in this case, we want this to be an error so that clients are completely unable to call this. In order to use this Kotlin feature of opt-in APIs, we actually have to go to our compiler flags in our build configuration again, because using opt-in APIs itself is not stable yet. So we have to opt in to using opt-in APIs. And once we've done that, any API that we want to share only between our own modules, but not with the outside world, we can annotate with internal my library API, and we can make the function itself public at this point. So with that setup, if we look at the core module and the add-on module side by side, uh, we now have a situation where if we try calling some API in the core module that's marked internal my library API, we get an error on the call site. This is what we want to happen to all of our clients, but we want to allow this call just from our own module. So how do we do that? Well, uh, we have a couple different choices here. Uh, one thing we could do is propagate this opt-in requirement. So if we mark this function with the same annotation, then it's allowed to use anything that's annotated with this. Uh, but anyone who tries to call the add-on function will run into the same problem and either has to propagate it further or has to opt into it somehow. So uh, let's see what other options we have. Something else we could do is that we can opt into using things that are annotated with internal my library API for the entire add-on module. To do this, we're going to the same Kotlin compiler flags again, and we have to specify the annotation that we want to opt into. If we do this, wherever we call anything that's annotated with internal my library API, we will no longer see any warnings or errors because it's all allowed globally for the entire module. On the other hand, we could also opt into using uh, these APIs just locally if we want to make sure that we pay careful attention to when we do this. And we can do this with the opt-in annotation, which again is part of the standard uh, Kotlin opt-in APIs, which means that to use it, you have to opt into using opt-in constructs. But once you've done that, uh, you can control what level you want to enable uh, these kinds of calls. So you can do this for each individual statement, or you can move it to the method or the class or the file level as well. And of course, anything that you're mark making public but marking with these magic Kotlin annotations will be completely public in Java code. So if you want to avoid Java clients from calling these APIs where, um, outside of your module, you can again use the JVM synthetic annotation to make it completely invisible to any Java code. OK, uh, here's a summary of uh, resources for this talk. Uh, you can find a written version of this as a blog post uh, on my website, and also the compatibility talk, the, uh, talk that I kept mentioning. I also encourage you to take a look at Effective Java, um, because it has a lot of good advice that very much applies to Kotlin. And I'm also recommending Effective Kotlin here. 
I stole the example of uh, explicit uh, typing for public interfaces from this book. You can find all of these resources and the slides and everything else on the talks page on my website. Uh, that's the easiest way to find all of those links. And if you are interested in the Android and Kotlin stuff, you can follow me on Twitter. To sum up mastering API visibility in Kotlin, minimal APIs are a very good idea. Uh, you should consider using internal visibility a lot to hide things within your modules. Explicit API mode will make you think more about what you want to make public and what you want to hide. Published APIs are good for solving the corner case of inlining internal stuff. And opt-in APIs are really useful whether you want to share things just within your own modules, or uh, you can also use these to um, mark some experimental APIs with warnings. Uh, for example, you'll see this in a lot of standard library and uh, Kotlin X coroutines uh, libraries where uh, new APIs that are not stable yet are marked with opt-in annotations so that you have to opt in consciously to using them before they are finalized and stable. And that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to go to the Q&A and see if we have any questions. OK, looking at questions. Uh, why was package level visibility removed in Kotlin? It would be hard if in case I have a util class with 10 method, methods that I want to keep in one package in a module. Um, yeah, uh, package level visibility is something we lost. So you can, you can do two things, depending on how broad you want to make the visibility of those utility classes. If you're using it very, very locally, you can put everything that it uses it into a single file and make it private. Otherwise, um, the best you can do is make it internal, and then you'll be able to use it all over your module. Uh, someone asked what software I used to create this presentation. Uh, I'm actually sharing the window right now, so I, I can't show you. Uh, but this and all of my other presentations are in PowerPoint. I saw the discussions in the chat about this being Jetpack Compose. Uh, I have definitely considered creating Compose uh, presentations before. I didn't do it yet. Uh, can JVM Synthetic be propagated with opt-in annotation? So for an internal API annotation, can we specify JVM Synthetic automatically? I don't believe you can do that. Um, I think you would need some uh, code processing, um, some kind of annotation processing tool and that does the propagation of like annotated annotations for you, unfortunately. Um, one more question. Uh, what's the biggest difference between writing apps and an SDK slash library? And what are the important considerations in the latter case? Uh, that's an entire other talk, at least. Uh, that's, that's several other talks. Um, I'll actually be giving that as a DroidCon webinar soon. So follow that. <laughs> Sweet. Seems like the questions have slowed down enough for whoever has additional questions. Uh, Martin, are you going to hang around to chat with people at tables if they want? Yeah, I'll be here to talk about library development, visibility, and anything around that. And of course, I'll be sitting at the sponsor booth for anyone who wants to chat about our really cool chat SDK for Android and all the other platforms as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, guys. Totally star that. It's it's again. It's not even about whether or not you're going to use it right now. It's about beating the iOS repository in terms of stars. <laughs> That's my perspective. Martin has a very different perspective as a professional who cares who who works on this. I'm just I'm in it for the game. <laughs> it's it's about sending a message. Exactly. <laughs> We're gonna go Android. <laughs> 
Um, all right. Well, thank you so much um, for this talk and for offering to edit the videos afterwards and for getting the sponsor and for being you.